What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. We're here at the LD Micro Conference in Los Angeles. I'm with uh, Arkimoto CEO and founder, Mark Frommeyer. What up, HyperChange? I'm really excited to have you on the show. Mark is uh, wrapping up a trip all around the country um, because the FUV is into production. They've started customer deliveries. Um, so really excited to get an update on all of that. So uh, maybe you could fill us in, Mark? Yeah, so, so we, we launched production in September of this year, uh, which is uh, which was actually the, uh, the 12 year, sort of the 12 year anniversary of starting Arkimoto, starting the very beginning of that process. Congrats. Launch production, thank you. It, it was a, uh, uh, it's a long road to get to the beginning sometimes. Um, and so uh, that, that's obviously the most significant milestone in the history of the company. We've had a chance to get early vehicles in the field to some of our, some of our earliest pre-order customers. We delivered our first vehicles to our first rental franchise. So you know, we have the rental first go-to-market business plan. Um, and so far, the responses from our customers have been incredibly positive. Responses from early media, yourself included, have been very positive, um, and we're just uh, working out. Obviously, early the early glitches in the program, both on the production side and then vehicles in the field. You get a lot more data when you have 30 vehicles cruising around every single day. Yeah, I think it is incredible that vehicle companies in general are such difficult businesses, and so many times you even hear about like companies, oh, they're going to come out with this this product, they're launching this electric thing, and they never actually like get to market in reality. And, um, and I think it's amazing that you guys, I've been following for you know a year or two now, and of course I was always skeptical, but seeing it in production, there's an Arkimoto right here next to us. We're gonna go on a test drive today, like I've ridden it. Um, I thought it was so fun. It's, it's just amazing to see the product into reality. And so now you guys, uh, can you fill us in a little bit about like where the production ramp is, how many you've delivered? Yeah, so, so we started at four a day. Uh, so, excuse me, so we started at four a week. Okay. Basically one a day. One a day. Uh, and we are now building at a rate of two a day, uh, so eight a week. Uh, and that's, it, it's just, we're, we're basically balancing it in, that, in that get up and running production mode. Well, we've run into everything from uh, supplier quality issues to shortages on various parts. Just working, getting that, getting that crank turning to start moving everything through the process. Uh, is, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of checking of, of, of every little bit that goes into the process. And then um, there's, there's just, things inevitably crop up after vehicles are out the door that we've had to address. And I, I think the team has just done a fantastic job of staying on top of it, keeping our early customers very happy uh, and getting ready for that increase in scale that, that we're really shooting for uh, in, the, in sort of the 12 months out time frame. Yeah, and I've, of course, as many of you know, following the Tesla production ramp, which we followed so closely on the channel, it took extremely long time. I think, in general, as rule of thumb, for these production ramps to get off off the ground and get going. Well, when you think about it, I mean, it's, it, it isn't just one company that's involved, right? It is. We have hundreds of suppliers coming in with different parts for each different part of the process, and so getting everything to work in in symphony uh, takes it takes a while for all that for that process to go, and to make sure that the that the quality is there for every single part of the vehicle. Yep. And another really exciting milestone you guys have kind of done at the same time is raising capital. So as an investor, that's something um, I've been looking at. I think it's one of the, you raised about $8 million yep. uh, in the past month. Um, that's probably the largest raise you've ever done or up there. Uh, Besides our IPO, yeah. So, wow. so it's, it, and it's certainly the largest raise we've done since we went public in September of 2017. Gives us runway to accomplish what we think are some very significant forward steps for the venture. Yeah, that must be really exciting. So now you guys, can you tell us a little bit about what you're planning to do with that money and how it's gonna impact the production rate? Yeah, well, yeah, so, so the, the real, the, the big high level goals for the venture over the next, over the sort of foreseeable future. One, we wanna make sure that our early customers are very happy with the product, that we, that we deliver a very high quality product uh, to our early adopters and to early media, because that's really gonna set the tone for the, the perception of the product in the market over the foreseeable future. Yep. Um, we, we need to do a lot of work to bring our own cost of goods sold down. So we're, we're anticipating that somewhere in targeting quarter two of next year, we'll be at positive gross margins. And then we're, our, our push is to get to basically a 20% gross margin as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and that will obviously allow us to, to really be in scale. Uh, because you, you can't make it up for, make it up in volume uh, if you have negative margins. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but True. but a lot of that is you know that's that that is process optimization that's going through every single piece of the bill of materials and making sure that we have 
the right approach to each part and the right supplier for each part. Uh, and then ultimately there is going to be some work that's going to come online in sort of like the 12 months out time frame that's going to be a substantial uh, simplification of some of the major drivetrain components. Um, so it's, it's the, you know, the, 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 big, the big goals are increase volume, decrease cost, uh, and then open up multiple rental outlets, rental franchises in the early part of next year so that we can uh, really begin to get a sense for what the, the financial actuals are for the rental first business model. And that's going to inform uh, not only how quickly we can scale the franchise model, but really ultimately whether we want to be focused on franchises or focused on owning our own rental stores over the long haul. Yeah, that's, that was actually my next question. Are you planning to put up the capital to make these company owned? Or the, the first Arkimoto uh, is a partnership where you kind of franchised it, right? Yeah, so, so, and, and we, we, right now we've really laid out three different pathways. One is, is partnering with existing vehicle rental companies. And mm -hmm. you see that with our, with our partnership with Go-Car Tours in San Francisco. They've already got facilities. They've got their own branding. They just need a better tour vehicle. And we believe that the fun utility vehicle is going to be an awesome way to experience and tour San Francisco. So yeah, that's totally a very right. natural partnership. Uh, the franchise model is where, uh, where a, a partner takes our branding, our technologies, we co-market, we co and then they, they're sort of like, an, it, 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 you can sort of imagine if, if it were Hertz. You know, Hertz franchises their rental outlets. It still looks like Hertz, but it's run by an independent operator. Uh, and then the final one would be stores that we ourselves own that are renting vehicles in, in destinations that are, that are meaningful. Um, and so the, the real advantage of, of the existing rental operation or, the existing, or a franchise rental is that we're able to leverage uh, our partners' market expertise, capital in the areas that they're in, uh, and we, we don't have to spend our uh, you know, sort of preciously guarded resources on every single one of those deployments. At the point that that rental model shows that it's, if it should show that it is a great business opportunity, then capital for spinning up rental outlets becomes much easier to acquire. Okay. And at that point, it would make a lot more sense for us to be owning and operating those stores. So in that scenario, our early franchisees get the benefit of being some of the only ones out there who have that opportunity. Um, and so depending on where we land on that spectrum, We'll, we'll, we'll shift more or, or less of the resources in, in that direction. Cool. And uh, one thing I want to move to is the backlog. You guys have had a huge backlog. I think over 4,000 people have yeah, placed Yeah, somewhere around 4,200. Yeah, so um, I guess in tandem with how you're, you're fulfilling that backlog and plan to go fulfill it and like prioritize that versus you know, the rapid responder, the deliberator, some of these other concepts, the, or, or the rental uh, operations, I'm kind of curious how you're strategizing where you deploy your your earliest units. Yeah, so, so the, the rapid responder and the deliberator, we're going to be piloting those in the first quarter of next year. Okay. Uh, but those will be in, in, in very low volume. Just basically getting a few vehicles out into existing fleets and saying, one, does this solve a, a, a need for your fleet? Uh, what, what do we need to add to it? What do we need to take away from it to make it ideal for your particular purpose? Um, and then really build the backlog for 2021 production. So we're aiming for a, a pretty major step up over the, over the course of the next, call it 10 to 16 months, from uh, you know, sort of the, the, what would be a rate of hundreds of vehicles a year that we're building at now to 10,000 plus vehicles per year within, within the next 16 months. And to do that, we need to have a firm order backlog, not just of FUVs, but also, you know, sort of the full spectrum of, of vehicles in our in our offering. Yeah, so. and and one thing I want to get to is is kind of crazy partnership ideas because I'm an investor and watching Arkimoto kind of execute and validate, you know, one step at a time the business model. Um, I think it seems more and more likely, or like I'm kind of rooting for a bigger company to come in and sort of take, make a strategic investment, like Amazon, Rivian, or companies like Uber, who I feel like don't really like they're getting into bikes, so they're kind of moving into smaller hardware. When I look at, at at sort of what we are offering, it is it is a fundamentally new form factor on the road, and so uh, one of the one of the things that's very exciting to me is that we are, you know, now that we actually have a product that is in the market, we can go to a fleet and say, hey, why don't you take this vehicle for a week, drive it around, see if it fits your needs. Our bet is that for a wide range of fleet needs, that the Arkimoto is actually a very good platform fit 
for, for fleet operators. And so in, in the past, when we have had those conversations, it's, it's not like they can just say, well, I can go, go get any motorcycle and, and, and test it out and, and think yours is going to be basically like this thing or any car. Mm -hmm. This is, it's, a, it's a unique new vehicle. And so to really evaluate it, you've got to have the product in the market and on the road. And I think that's really one of the pivotal pieces in, in, all of the, in all of the sort of larger potential partner conversations that we're having is that we actually have a production vehicle. Yeah. And, so, and so all the conversations that we had a year ago, two years ago, and so on were sort of like, well, hey, you know, come back when you've, when you've actually got through the certification gauntlet, when you've actually got the vehicle tested, when you understand the manufacturer process, when we can actually buy one. Um, and so that, that's, it, I, I would say, you know, we, we don't have anything to talk about uh, in any sub substantial sense just yet, but the, the tenor of those conversations has really changed. Yeah, and I think it's so interesting when I think about Uber and Lyft and the valuations these companies have, their IPO, their cash position, and the way they're kind of struggling to build a moat in this sort of new mobility space, like whether it's smaller personal mobility or Uber doing Uber Eats, and sort of wanting to leverage their whole platform as like a delivery uh, sort of infrastructure. So then I think about what you're doing with the Deliverator and think that could have huge opportunities and sort of like small urban fleets. So I don't know, that's just kind of one thing I've always thought is a no-brainer for one of these companies. It's like for a $10 million investment in Arkimoto, it's such a small company that's such a small fraction of their cash to get exposure and then to partner on vehicles. I think that's, it seems like a huge opportunity. Um, yeah, it kind of recalls the conversation that we were having in New York where uh, if, if you think about rideshare, I mean, the, the challenge and the reason why rideshare companies are saying, well, autonomous is the future is because it, the, 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 there's a significant cost associated with having somebody else drive you around, right? And wouldn't it be cool if you could just jump on an Arkimoto anywhere in Manhattan, drive it across town, and leave it behind at any garage or at any valet and just have, have the, the charging done? So I think there's, there are, are sort of next generation vehicle sharing partnerships that are possible, that are, that are really well dialed for this particular platform. Yeah, and one of the quirky ones you mentioned is the, the parking lot idea. There's all these parking lots all around Manhattan, like icon parking lots, hundreds of locations. Imagine if you just had a time, and I've actually, I live near one, and I see them having charging for electric cars. You could easily squeeze a little Arkimoto in there, and then you go down to your building, pick it up, you can go anywhere in Manhattan for a couple bucks, and especially after driving it in New York City and seeing the way it weaves through traffic, like, the, probably the most fun way, you don't have to go on the dirty subway, way cheaper than getting an Uber, you're sitting in traffic less time, um, that's actually something in your presentation here that I thought was fascinating is your comparable Google map time to travel. Like in Manhattan, you're actually getting places faster because you can weave in and out of traffic. So for the rapid responder, yep. for the deliverator, like this is a, it's, that's an interesting component to the utility and time. No, I mean, imagine you're in dense Manhattan traffic and you beat Google Maps time by 20% on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. you know, for, for an individual, that's a great convenience feature. For a fleet operator, for a delivery driver, that's it's money in the pocket. Time is money. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, so we think that is a big deal. Also, if you're in an Arkimoto, instead of being in a full-size car, you're you're taking away space that's 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 wasted on the road. Yeah. Right. You're you're one. You're using spaces that cars aren't using, and two, you're taking a car out of circulation and replacing it with something that takes up about a third of the space. And the same the same thing goes for garages. That my my understanding is that the garages. Uh, in New York and in, in other major metro areas have suffered, one, as a result of ride share because people are owning their own cars less, and second, because of things like congestion pricing. And so if we can help utilize spaces inside of garages at, at a much greater level of parking efficiency, much greater level of charging efficiency, um, then that seems like a giant win-win. And one of the things you hit on that I think is so interesting is the new form factor of the Arkimoto and kind of what that enables. So that gets me to my next thing, like the kind of elephant in the room is like Tesla, their battery technology, their form factor. And the more I was thinking about it, I was like, Tesla's been innovative in so many different ways. Literally every single part of the car, the way it moves, you know, the touch screen, the way it's all software, it's all self-driving, the way they build the car, the way they sell the car, everything about Tesla is so innovative, except for the form factor of the vehicle where they basically just replicated um, you know, whatever the internal combustion engine is or like this typical sedan that's been around for decades. So Arkimoto on the flip side has really focused its innovation on a new form factor of vehicle. Um, and sort of that's what you've been perfecting for 12 years with, with this idea of it being way more efficient. So that's when I think of like Tesla's idea of 
okay, we're interested in licensing our, our skateboard. And I'm like, okay, do we really want to license our batteries to a car company who's in this for the wrong reason that we're actually competing with head on? Or do we want exposure to a different form factor that's smaller? So what I'm trying to get at is I think there's a, just a no-brainer battery partnership opportunity between Tesla and Arkimoto, especially when I was just at the Cybertruck event and I saw the ATV and I'm like, okay, so they can make a, a smaller battery pack super easily. They are interested in smaller mobility uh, products and th they're pushing into that anyway. And so, um, I don't know, do you have any comments on like how easy would it be to integrate a Tesla battery? Is that something that... Well, well the, the Arkimoto battery bay is, it's, it's, it's just a big rectangular brick that is sits right square in the center of the vehicle at the bottom plane uh, and, and it's, it is, it's a little bit flexible, so we can widen it slightly or make it slightly taller or slightly shorter to accommodate different types of cells. I mean, I think... A lot of those 2170 cells could fit, though. The, the, <laughs> it seems I, like they I could arrange I, when, when, I, when I did the just really rough analysis, it was something like 30 kilowatt hours of cells can fit inside of the backbone uh, of, of 2170s. So we're talking um, about a longer range arc moto for 10... It'd be like another 50% more wow. capacity. And potentially um, cheaper. Potentially, right? So, so to me, the the uh, you know, we, we want to um, sort, sort of be a, a, as much as possible a macrobiotic vehicle company that is like sourcing as locally as possible wherever we are in production, um, and that's uh, we're constrained now just because we're a small enterprise. But uh, the 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 Gigafactory is certainly the closest large scale, most advanced battery manufacturing plant in the world, and so. I, I think that would be a, a, a no-brainer, certainly from our perspective, is something to explore. Um, and I would say that you, you know when you look at what Tesla has done, they've they've just been really laser focused on saying, hey, we're going to make cars radically better by putting in world-class batteries, world-class drivetrain, uh, amazing styling, uh, all the rest. And we have been very focused on okay, what's a, what's a new footprint for transportation that's focused more on the daily driving need, I think there it makes, uh, it just wherever there's an opportunity for us to combine forces with other enterprises in order to advance a shared mission, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to think about it. Yeah, and, I, and the reason why I think there's kind of more there, more to it is just because it seems like when I think 10 years out, 15 years out about the future of transport, is it still all cars if we're just still doing so many of our trips in these smaller things? Like, I think there's a lot of innovation happening in these smaller vehicles for a good reason. There's a reason why Bird hit a $2 billion valuation in like a year and scale it, its revenue like crazy and Uber and Lyft are buying up all these smaller mobility you know, companies. It's because that there's a huge pent up consumer demand to find new ways to get around cities that's faster, that's more efficient with a much smaller footprint. And so that's where I feel like Tesla is actually lacking exposure to that part of the market. Uh, um, and it's almost an Achilles, like just in as a investor, like if I think of crazy Achilles heels to Tesla, I'm like, what if the car becomes irrelevant? That's just kind of, I don't see it becoming irrelevant, but I see a, a shift happening in, in miles traveled, a little bit less to cars, more to these kind of smaller mobility devices. Well, well, there is a dramatic disconnect between what cars can do, the capabilities of the full-size car, and what we actually use cars for on a daily basis. And I think that speaks a bit to this sort of, I've, I've heard a, a, a reporter friend of mine call it the sort of the Cambrian explosion of new mobility devices is yep. lots of people trying lots of different things to say, hey, this this model of the full-size car for for everyday one-person, two-person trips just doesn't make any sense. Yep. You, we get crowded, congested cities. Thankfully, we now have electric cars coming online, so the, the, the emissions factor goes down, but you st it still takes a lot of energy to move 4,000, 3,500 pounds of material down the road just so that you yourself can go get a cup of coffee. So we're in LA right now. I think I've spent, I feel like I've spent half my trip just in traffic because it's so inefficient. I feel like the urban populations are only getting worse. Like there's most of the cars only have one person in them. I just feel like the way to maximize, like there's that metric, or, or I think you guys even have a slide of it of like, here's people in cars, versus people like in buses, versus people on bikes, and the amount of space they take up on a road. Yeah, we, it's really an inefficient use of space. And I feel like our cities in general are just ugly because there's roads everywhere and parking lots everywhere. And this is like, I don't know, it's personally something that really bothers me because I feel like we're so advanced in many ways, yet... It, it is crazy that we cover 40% of our cities with asphalt to move and park cars. Yeah. 40, like, it's like 40% of our civic infrastructure is just covered with... the And, and in places, you know, li living up in Oregon where it is just this verdant, beautiful land and we cover it with a surface that's more dead than the deadest desert, 
just so that I mean, stand. All you got to do is stand in the middle of a residential street. Yeah. And just think to yourself, this street exists so that one person can pass one other person. Giant avenues, right? That's to me. It's just it's nuts. It makes it so that everything's farther apart. It makes it so that we've got a. Uh, it, it's it almost makes it so you you have to have a car in order to deal with all the infrastructure that's designed for cars. And there's a reason why you know uh, Google invested so much in Waymo, and and like Elon Musk is is tweeting about the boring company wanting to just build tunnels to get around traffic. And I think it's because these companies are appreciating that this mobility problem is a huge opportunity. And that's why Ar Arcimoto is you know I'm an investor in the company and find it so fascinating because. The market cap is so small, but I feel like you're so advanced and kind of actually starting to solve this problem in reality. And everyone else is pouring so much money into and all these concepts that don't exist, that aren't real, yet the Arc is actually in production today, sort of making a difference. And I feel like the amount that's been accomplished on like a shoestring budget with such tiny resources, if you have the resources of someone like Tesla to say, we'll help you out with the batteries and like, you know, I, I don't know what else, manufacturing or whatever, like it could just make the chances of uh, Arkimoto's impact would be greatly accelerated. Armor us up. Yeah, you know, and, and it would be a win for both companies um, or, you know, whoever that partner is. And so I just think it's really interesting. Like I always come back to like Amazon's investing in Rivian and they ordered 100,000 of them. Like you can't even drive the Rivian. I mean, Rivian's awesome and I visited them, super cool company, but like the car doesn't exist, like you're saying. Yet they're at like a couple billion dollar valuation. Building Arkimoto has been a very challenging road. I, I think partly because we have, have been constrained in terms of capital, uh, and that has taken uh, for for uh, there, there has been I, I think in the in the vehicle space there have been people who have made some really big bets on all on the same segment of the car market, luxury cars, luxury electric cars. It, it just billions and billions and billions of dollars poured into this fairly narrow slice of the market space with so far one company that has really made it through and shown to be dominant over time but you know to, to me it, it, particularly looking at now the emergence of companies like bird like lime where you you have now resources flowing in at the entirely opposite end of the market um, I think I, I think gives some hope that that the the world of investment is, is taking a slightly broader lens to the topic and that now that we are in production and delivering and starting to show a real market traction, that, that that's something that will help uh, reevaluate where we stand in the marketplace. Yeah, and I think it's an exciting way to take like the word of mouth. You know, I think that's you guys have almost done zero marketing for the product. We have this huge backlog, and now that it's going to be on the roads, like when we were driving it around Manhattan, like everyone stops, everyone asks about it, everyone's like, "Whoa, what is that thing?" So I think. That'll be exciting. I'm excited to watch how that plays out over the next six months as these get in the wild and people react and they post videos on the internet and show their friends. Well, and we definitely noticed that there is a difference between how people react when they see pictures of the Arcimoto and how they react when they see it in person. It's totally different. Right. Especially and, when you see it driving around like New York City and you're like, weep, you know? Yeah. It's like, what is that? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think when when you look at you, say, you sort of think, oh, well, you know, three wheel vehicle, it's super niche -y. like who's going to be into that sort of thing? Uh, and it ends up being a much wider swath of the population than I, I would initially have thought. Um, it's it is, it's it's little kids just pointed out they, they love it. It's uh, it's you know people who are retirees. It's people who just go oh that's going to solve my daily transportation problem. So um, I, to me that says that there is a there's a real appetite in the market for something new that's a real solution. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I really enjoyed hey. this conversation. Uh, always love having you on the channel. And I have a uh, Arcimoto referral code, code HyperChange, um, which I, we need to get some like incentive yeah, we, going because we, I, I want to rack up the. the uh, uh, yeah, put it, put in your put in your referrals now. We're we're definitely gonna we're we're still working out the details of the referral program. Which actually, you guys were one of the early ones who said you guys have to have referrals. So we put yes. the referral code space in the pre-order page on the website. So you can stick HyperChange in there and uh, uh, give give them some credit, but there'll be some benefit both to the referrer and the referee for uh, for doing that. Yes, and I would say to all the viewers who are watching, like, Akimoto, what is that, this crazy little three-wheel thing? All I would say is you've got to just drive it. That's like the best way to understand it. If you ever get the chance, go for a test drive, and then you'll get what we're talking about. But thank you much, so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.